sweet spot, if you want this to be a long-term maintainable lifestyle, the sweet spot for me has generally been around three months. Three mm. months in a place is long enough to arrive, to learn how to survive, which takes a lot of time and energy that people underestimate dramatically, uh, to relax into the place, to make those connections, to enjoy what it has to offer, to use it as a base for exploration, and then to move on. Hey everyone, it's Norm Ferrar, aka The Beard Guy here, and welcome to another Lunch with Norm, the Amazon and e-commerce podcast. Today, we're going to be talking about something we've never talked about, traveling long-term while working remotely. We're going to be talking about what the difference is between lifestyle travel and your vacation. What is a financially sustainable travel? <coughs> Excuse me, got a bit of a cough today. Kelsey was over and we had too many cigars. And what are some of the remote hacks when you work, uh, when you travel long term? So welcome to Lunch with Norm, the e-commerce and Amazon FBA podcast. Okay, like I said, we're going to be talking about long-term travel while working remotely. Our guest today is AKA The Professional Hobo. She sold everything she owned, including the business financial planning practice that she had back in 2006 to travel the world. She also has enjoyed a travel lifestyle ever since and is considered one of the original digital nomads and lifestyle travel bloggers. She's combined her expertise as a former certified financial planner with her lifestyle travel experience. Now, she goes out to teach people how to travel long term in a financially sustainable way. Now, I'm very curious about this. This is a first time guest. A matter of fact, we met, met while traveling actually on the online, online sellers cruise. Uh, and this is Nora Dunn. So we'll be talking to her in a second, but first let's get head over to a sponsor. I want to thank Jeff Schick Legal for sponsoring this episode of Lunch with Norm. You've probably heard on the podcast about Amazon suspensions. They're very real. It can happen at any time. And when it does happen, how do you get out of it? How does the little guy like you and me get out of these suspensions without paying an arm and a leg in legal fees? This is where Jeff Schick Legal is here to help. For a very low monthly retainer, for only $89, get access to Amazon attorney Jeff Schick. That's right. You can sit back, relax, enjoy that cup of coffee while listening to the Lunch with Norm podcast, knowing that you have an advocate and a partner in your business success. But wait, just mention Lunch with Norm and receive 50% off the first two months. Get the protection you need and visit jeffschick.com today. That's J-E-F-F. S-C-H-I-C-K dot com. Now let's get back to the show. Welcome, Nora. Hey, Norm. It's so good to see you. And you too. Wow. You must be in the Swiss Alps. <laughs> These are actually the Bulgarian Pyrin Mountains that I fell in love with last year and will be returning to in a few months this year when I attend the annual Nomad Fest conference in Bansko, Bulgaria. I didn't know that there was Nomad conferences. There are a few. This is one of them, uh, which is uh, it's, it gets about 500 digital nomads from around the world. It's kind of like spring break for digital nomads, but there's workshops involved as well. Uh, and it's a fantastic little town. It's a little ski town in the Bulgarian mountains. Uh, and summer is kind of the off season, but uh, there's a couple of co-working spaces that were set up there, uh, I don't know, maybe about seven years ago. And it just made this tiny little town, nondescript town, a hub for digital nomads. So there apparently wow. are more digital nomads per capita there than anywhere else in the world. Wow. And I, I do round. know um, a lot of people in Bulgaria uh, that are involved with Amazon, uh, mostly service providers and really just smart people, stuff that, uh, yeah, coders, programmers. But, uh, you know, uh, Spencer, Luke, uh, Rad, if you can get Tony, ping Tony, and see if you can get him uh, to listen today, because he has just sold everything. He had a he had a retail business. He just closed everything down, and he's heading to Bali on his first nomad experience. So that's his life, and he's not a young buck. 
you know, well, he's a lot younger than me, but it, it's not like he's in his twenties and he's doing this. So I thought, wow, this is really cool that he's going to be able to do this and just enjoy life. So this is what, when we were talking about this on the ship, I was fascinated about the lifestyle. We had um, Sumner uh, Hobart and his wife, Ali on, and they, they do this as well. And they're just traveling. They put in their work, they have a great time and they're just, they just love it. You know, and I know so many other people that are doing this. So what got you to say, oh, I have a, I have a successful business. <laughs> Why don't I just sell it and, you know, start from scratch? Yeah, you, you could certainly say it was counterintuitive, to say the least, because ironically, of course, I, I had this financial planning practice and I had spent six years of blood, sweat and tears building this practice into what it was. And technically, all I had to do for the rest of my career uh, was just sit back and earn less, uh, and earn more and more money while doing less and less work. So I, I'd hit that tipping point, And yet what I did was the counterintuitive move, which was to sell it as along with everything else that I owned. So I could embrace this idea of traveling the world on a one-way ticket. And it, this happened ultimately because I hit some kind of critical mass in my life. I had a lifelong dream hatched at the you know tender age of nine years old. There was a specific moment when I basically hatched this dream to experience the world from the inside out, to understand how people live, work, play, eat, sleep, all the things around the world. And I had in the ensuing 20 or so years been trying to kind of satisfy this little itch of mine through vacations, traditional vacations. And it wasn't working. And along the way, I also had this, this little voice in the back of my head that kept saying, you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. There's something else out there for you. And so I, I, here I am over here trying to have these vacations and you know, crack the code of the, of the world around me. And here I am with this little voice. So I fill my life with more and more activities to try to make this voice shut up. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I was a Rotarian, I was a Toastmaster, I was a professional actor, singer, dancer, I was in film and television, I was in theater, I was doing all the things. And I was incredibly busy. Excuse me for... It's always when you go live that you swallow the wrong way. <laughs> <coughs> or smoke too many cigars the night before. <laughs> well, luckily I didn't have that problem. Anyway, I just hit this total critical mass where I burnt out. I became very ill. And uh, it's only when my body completely shuts down that I'm forced to really confront my life choices. <laughs> um, I've learned to see the signs usually before that happens. But <clears throat> that was one of those incidences where I was really taking a hard look at my life. And, and someone took my hands in theirs and said, what do you want to do? And I said, I just want to retire. Uh, and I was 30 at the time, you know, or turning 30. And I said, uh, you know, I, I thought about what that really meant. What did retirement really mean to me? Well, it meant traveling the world. It meant climbing the mountains of the world like these. It meant volunteering around the world. It meant living around the world. And I worried that if I was going to put another tradition, you know, another 30 years into the traditional workforce, waiting for an actual retirement, a traditional retirement, to live this lifestyle, I might not be willing, or even tragically, I might not be able to do that. So I realized there was no time like the present and that the cost of not living this lifelong dream right away was greater than the cost of not doing it. And here I am 17 years later, as much a surprise to me as anyone else that I'm actually still at it. I'm still traveling the world uh, and I still absolutely love it. My life and lifestyle have changed many, many, many times along the way. I've made every mistake in the book yep. <laughs> uh, and that's half the fun as far as I'm concerned. So one of the things that I'm curious about, <clears throat> and I think maybe there's a mistake here uh, when people decide that they're going to go and do this, they can't separate the vacation vision from actually working. Um, are there any mistakes or w what are some things that maybe some um, new nomads um, would face? The number one misconception about this lifestyle 
is is that it is a vacation or it is even close to being a vacation. Uh, and it's a misconception that that covers so many different things like budgeting. Uh, I have some videos that talk about how full-time travel, my, I experienced this, that the cost of traveling full-time actually can be way less than it ever cost me to live in one place. And I, just, I experienced this myself in the first couple of years abroad and it surprised me. So I actually spent my first 10 years publishing my annual income and expenses all in to prove that full-time travel could be financially sustainable. But people who don't go that far down the rabbit hole of content that I have and just see my blanket statement that traveling full-time can cost less than living in one place immediately are applying the idea that travel is a vacation and telling mm. me that it's impossible. I must be a freeloader. I must be staying in cardboard shacks at the side of the road. I must, oh, come on, a hotel times 30 days alone is way more than you would spend. And they're thinking like vacations. So when it comes to budgeting, but then also planning out this lifestyle, it's important to separate the idea that the travel lifestyle is the same as a vacation. So there's two main applications of this separation. One of which is, again, if we think from a budgeting standpoint, when travel is your lifestyle, you're not staying in hotels all the time. You're, you're finding apartments that you can rent for one, two, three, or even more months at a time. And when you find these short and medium term rentals, suddenly your cost just went down extraordinarily. You're also not constantly getting on planes, trains, automobiles, and taxis the way you might in a one week vacation uh, because you're working full time. And that's a, re a really important thing to consider. When you work full time at home, how often do you go out and do touristy activities? Or even anything that could be uh, similar to a tour touristy activity. I mean, you maybe go out a couple of times a week to see friends or do something, you know, social. And then the rest of the time, you're tending to the tasks of life, laundry, shopping, Netflix and chill time, working. That's no different on the road when you travel full time than when you're, uh, when you're at home. So that's an important differentiator because now think of your cost. If you're not out doing a touristy activity every single day, you're not spending as much money either. Now, what that also means from a planning perspective is that you need to take more time at a destination. A week, two weeks, three weeks, even one month at a destination is sometimes not enough because you're not going out every day and you're not on that vacation bandwagon where you don't have anything else to do and you're doing nothing but exploring. If you have to, if you extrapolate and extend that exploring time, you need longer in a place to feel the place out, to learn how to live there and to learn to make friends and enjoy what a place has to offer. So that is the number one misconception is as long as you get out of the vacation mindset, as long as you get out of the idea that you have to conquer a destination before you leave it. Like perfect example, last year I was in these Bulgarian mountains. I had a month in the town of Bansko, one town in the country of Bulgaria. That's it. And people said to me, well, did you visit Sofia? How much time did you spend in Sofia? I said, yeah, a couple of nights on the way in and out. Oh, did you go to Varna? No. Did you go to this place? No. Oh, did you do this train? No. Well, what did you do? I'm like, well, I lived in Bulgaria for a month. And that's also why I'm going back because I know that there's lots more that I could see and experience, but you can't do it all in one go. One of the things that you're Canadian, right? Yep. I'm down the street from you proverbially, Nora. See, we're, we're, we're hanging out. And you thought I didn't remember, but <laughs> I'm curious because I know of our medical system. Mm. And if you're outside of Canada for an extended period of time, you're not going to get our, uh, in Ontario anyways, the OHIP coverage. How do you like, how do you make sure that you have, is it a special insurance that you can pick up? Uh, when you're traveling, so you get hurt in Bulgaria, knock on wood, you'd never do. But, you know, how do you handle that? Sure. As Canadians, we're, we have a bit of a unique situation in that if we do not have uh, our underlying OHIP coverage, then uh, standard normal travel insurance will not cover us abroad, or they will dramatically lower the maximum levels of coverage that they will provide. So uh, in Ontario in particular, if you're gone from the country or from the province for more than six months, technically you lose OHIP. Right. Uh, other provinces are a little bit different. 
Uh, and the way around this, if you do lose your OHIP coverage, if you are absent from the country for more than uh, what's allowable, the solution is international health insurance, also called expat insurance. And this is a form of insurance that will cover you. you it's like a health plan, basically, that follows you around the world and covers you wherever you are. So I had that for many years. Uh, and I did basically just structured the policy. So because all I really wanted the insurance for was a, a travel, a medical emergency, uh, because those are the things that will bankrupt you. So I structured the, uh, things like, you know, doctors uh, visits and preventative care are usually quite inexpensive around the world. So I decided I would pay for those sorts of expenses with cash. And I designed my policy to have a really high deductible such that it was only going to be applicable uh, when an emergency hit. And then that kept my premiums low. But that's definitely the solution if you want to travel full time. Mm. Now, Americans don't have the same problem. So because they don't have a base level of uh, provincial or national coverage in the same way that we do. So for insurance solutions for you, regardless of your citizenship or residency, <laughs> maybe I'll just leave it at that. And uh, he's just picked up. He planned it, planned it well, and he uh, decided to go to Bali. And I know um, that that's a destination right now that's just loving uh, digital nomads. They've got a whole new program um, set up strictly for digital nomads to go there. But uh, I'm, I'm just kind of curious. When you're going to a country, there's two questions. First of all, how long you said, you know, a month before, but it might be longer. And is it apartments, condos? What are you looking for? It's a great question. It's changed many, many times along the way, and it's continuing to change because this year in particular, I'm experimenting with a new way of traveling and living around the world. But generally speaking, the sweet spot, if you want this to be a long-term maintainable lifestyle, the sweet spot for me has generally been around three months. Three mm. months in a place is long enough to arrive, to learn how to survive, which takes a lot of time and energy that people underestimate dramatically, uh, to relax into the place, to make those connections, to enjoy what it has to offer, to use it as a base for exploration, and then to move on. Uh, I've definitely moved. Uh, I, I mean, a month per destination is maintainable for a short period of time if you're doing all the work yourself. It's more maintainable if you're using one of the programs that I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, and shorter periods of time, have at her, but don't either expect to sacrifice your work or your some aspect of your travel lifestyle or sleep. Right. Uh, because there's, there's always going to be a cost. I mean, I spent an entire year traveling so fast that the entire year, the longest I stayed anywhere was two and a half weeks. On average, I was changing beds every five days. Oh, that would be killer. It, well, it was. I needed, I was basically comatose for six months after that. <laughs> <laughs> which is cool too because here's the beauty of this lifestyle you get to call the shots yeah all the time if you want to change something up change it up if you want to go faster go faster if you want to stay a while and go slower go slower it, it, you will find your ideal pace of travel and your ideal locations and the things that you like to do in the places that you visit and the only way i mean i can give you all the experience-based advice in the world and i will definitely help people set up their affairs, arrange their, you know, design their lifestyle and arrange their affairs so you can travel effectively, stress-free, cover all your bases and avoid a lot of the mistakes that I made. But there's still a certain rite of passage and a joy to carving out your own style because everyone experiences and travels the world in their own unique way. You know, I was... Really a lot... And it's very hectic, uh, you know, just a week here, a week there, usually two weeks out of the month. I've cut back this year quite a bit. But one thing I found, I went to the Philippines and I was staying in this four star, four and a half star uh, hotel. And, um, yeah, you, you, I paid. It wasn't that expensive. It was the Philippines. So it wasn't really that that much. But then about three weeks, I was there for a month, um, about three weeks into it, I'm talking to somebody there. And they asked if I was, um, they were condos as well. And they said, uh, oh, you know, what are you paying? And I told them the price that I'm paying per night. And he said, oh, you could have just rented the condo for a month for $300. It was, what? 
and, and, and you know, I don't really think about that. It's always, oh, you got to go in, you get a hotel. But like you were saying, if you're longer term, you can go in and as long as it's like, I, th I think, tell me if I'm wrong, but in Canada or the U.S., it would definitely be a lot more expensive still to live because it's Canada or the U.S. But like going to Bulgaria, I went to the Philippines or going to Vietnam, Singapore, I guess, you know, that is a huge reduction in cost right there. So absolutely, you're right about that. I will also say, however, there are places in North America and Western Europe and really all around the world that are set up to help people stay for in places that are not hotels for periods of time that are longer than a few days or weeks. So I have an article on my website that is all about um, how to find digital nomad friendly accommodation that's not Airbnb. Uh, and I actually use that as my as my primary place. If I'm going somewhere and looking for a place to stay, that's my first point of research. And I check there's a variety of different websites that are that you where you can find these short to medium term rentals uh, and that will be significantly less than a hotel. Hmm. Um, so that's a that's one way to tackle this. Uh, yeah. Another way to tackle it is something called co-living. Have you heard of co-living, Norm? No. It's. It's an interesting concept. It's designed for people who travel the world while working remotely. And uh, basically the concept is, you know, it might be a repurposed boutique hotel or it might be a very large house with a lot of bedrooms. The idea being everybody has their own personal space, their own bedroom and whatnot. And then they share the common area spaces, living room, dining room, kitchen, um, recreational areas. And then because it's designed for remote workers, there's inherently going to be things like that we need, like good internet and ergonomically friendly workspaces. So it allows people to live and work together in a space that is designed for people who have our lifestyles. So that's one of the things that I'm experimenting with this year is staying in some of these places. Uh, and it's very, it's very nice if you are, uh, even if you're a couple, I met a lot of couples at co-living spaces, but definitely if you're traveling solo, co-living spaces are great because uh, they give you an opportunity to experience community and to make friends with people who have similar lifestyles which uh, in the grander scheme of things is an important thing to have along the way uh, because it gives you that sense of belonging and community and friends who you can meet up with and have epic experiences around the world with uh, as you go, which is really kind of uh, nice. And I'm also, I have to note here, I am ultimately an introvert, so I like my personal space. And in a co-living scenario, I'm able to get that as and when I want, but then it's also very easy to socialize. So like if I rented my own apartment, I may be less likely to go out and do things as often if I didn't have, you know, like I went downstairs and I'm, you know, cooking my breakfast and some, you know, some of my housemates might say, oh, we're going to this place tonight. I'm, well, I might be a little more inclined to do that because they're right there and I'm going to go with them and that'll be fun. And then we can meet other people while we're there. So it's really handy. Well, I guess, and we're going to, it's the bottom of the hour, so we're, we'll go to a sponsor fairly soon, but Another thing that just stands out for me anyways, um, if you've got a pet and I'm talking anything bigger than a small dog, um, it's probably pretty tough or I wouldn't think anybody would be bringing their, you know, St. Bernard with them if they have a St. Bernard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I know all kinds of people who travel with pets. Really? Uh, and yeah, there's a, there's actually, <clears throat> there's a, a guy, Chase, Warrington, I think is his name. He has a podcast called About Abroad, and he and his wife are uh, nomadic. They have various bases in a lot of the places that they go, but they also have a large dog, and he talks regularly about what it's like to travel with a large dog. It's a little more work because the dog needs paperwork, and sometimes, you know, depending on what countries you're going to, you have to deal with possible quarantine issues, uh, and then, of course, whatever accommodation you find needs to be pet-friendly as well. So yeah. it is an additional level of challenges, but it is far from impossible. The same goes for families. I know lots of digital nomad families, including one family that has, they have seven children now. They hit the road when they had five. Uh, so it, it listen, it, anything's possible. That is not the answer I thought you'd say. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we are at the bottom of the hour. And if there's anybody that's new, that's listening, we always have something at the end of this podcast called the wheel of Kelsey. If you're interested in joining the Wheel of Kelsey, it's hashtag Wheel of Kelsey. Take two people, you get a second entry. And today we have a few things. Nora, 
what is the giveaway? I'm going to give away a free copy of my book that is called How to Get Free Accommodation Around the World. I, in my first 10 years of full-time travel, I saved over $100,000 by getting my accommodation for free. Jeez. So I wrote the book on it. There's five different ways to get an accommodation for free. Uh, two in particular are particularly conducive to the digital nomad lifestyle. So in this book, I talk about all of these forms of free accommodation. I show you how to get it, where to get it, how to stand out, how to get the gigs, and how to work remotely while you're doing it. Awesome. And I think there's something for everybody today, isn't there? Yes, there is. If you go to theprofessionalhobo.com slash free gift, you can sign up for my checklist of 10 things to do before you travel long term. And these are some of those things I referred to re earlier that are logistics and ways to arrange your affairs so you can hit the road as effectively as possible right from the get-go. Okay. So just again, your website, what is it? It is theprofessionalhobo.com. And that has your blog on it as well, right? Yes. Perfect. All right. So, Kelsey, are you ready, sir? Finger on button. Press, please. Get this right, please. Just hit the button. Are you struggling to keep up with your Amazon business? Do you need help from a skilled, reliable virtual assistant? Well, look no further than the Virtual Assistant Academy, or VAA Philippines. Founded by successful Amazon sellers who know the challenges of hiring quality VAs, VAA specializes in locating, screening, training, and supporting high-quality VAs in the Philippines. Their VAs receive extensive Amazon training and ongoing professional development and are committed to a long-term working relationship with you. Partner with VAA and experience the peace of mind knowing that you have a dedicated Amazon trained VA who's up to date with the latest tools and trends in the dynamic Amazon marketplace. Head over to VAAPhilippines.com and let VAA match you with your ideal VA today. Okay. Uh, one other thing you, when you said you saved a hundred thousand bucks, Let's talk about that. So, you know, uh, how did you save over a hundred thousand bucks over your first 10 years? By getting my accommodation for free, <clears throat> easy peasy. So when I was, I mean, if you think about the most expensive aspect of the travel lifestyle, it is accommodation, right? The second most expensive aspect is going to be transportation. So this is why traveling slowly is the key to making this lifestyle sustainable, not only from an energetic standpoint and a logistical standpoint, but a financial standpoint as well. So the fewer, you know, winged beasts that you're getting on, uh, you know, planes, trains, taxis, yeah. tuk-tuks, all that sort of stuff. Obviously, the fewer of things that you're doing like that, the less you move around, the less you'll spend. But accommodation and getting free accommodation is a really interesting way of traveling the world. And I discovered it when I was selling all of my stuff. The woman who came to buy my couch said, uh, you know, she was really fascinated with this lifestyle I was describing that I had no idea what I was going to do. But, you know, I was like, I'm going to travel the world. She's like, wow, that's cool. And she said, are you going to do any woofing when you go? And I said, what? And she said, woofing. She said, it's woof. And, you know, it's an acronym, a worldwide work on organic farms. I was like, I've never heard of this. She said, yeah, you volunteer and trade for, and they give you a place to stay. I'm like, oh, this sounds really interesting. Now, my thumbs are not green. I'm not really kind of an organic farming sort of girl, but I did a little bit of research and discovered there's a whole world of different ways that you can volunteer and trade for a place to stay. So over the years, I did things like uh, I was designing marketing plans. I was, um, uh, you know, chopping firewood. I was painting murals. I was milking goats. I was, I mean, I did like all these kind of crazy things uh, that uh, in trade for a free place to stay. And that was fun. But I did realize that it's not super conducive to the digital nomad lifestyle because you have to spend time doing these volunteer gigs. And that will be time that you might normally be spending on your on your online business. Right. So what it was, though, was amazingly immersive. Like I had experiences and I met people that I never possibly could have met any other way. And what it did also do was it led me to these other forms of free accommodation that include house sitting, include couch surfing. It includes living on boats. I lived on boats in the Caribbean for three months, not a night oh. on land. Uh, and there's also home exchanges as well. So if you don't want to be crazy like I do and sell everything, you could use your home as collateral for, and, and people will come and stay in your home while you're not there. And that gives you 
you know, points in the, in the home exchange karma bank. And there are sites that will hook you up with these opportunities. And then you can stay in other people's homes for free. And the advantage of this beyond obviously the financial advantages of not paying money for your accommodation is also that you get to live very locally. So when you're house sitting or home exchanging, you're living in a local's home. Uh, often when you're volunteering as well, it's the same thing. And by so doing now, you have a few things that are important as digital nomads, like a kitchen and the ability to shop and cook. That's also going to save you some money. But then also most people's homes have some kind of workspace that will be at least somewhat ergonomically friendly. So you'll have the ability to get your work done along the way as well. And of course, you get the ability to live a slice of local life. Like one of the things, Norm, when you were staying in that hotel, um, I, I'm willing to bet that on the whole, it was kind of an impersonal experience. In order for you to get out and have something that you might call a local experience, you had to leave the hotel and go somewhere and do something and really search out the, you know, I hate the term off the beaten path experience. Uh, whereas if you are already living locally and you are making friends with your neighbors, you are already getting an idea of what it's like to be in this place and off that beaten path. Right. Yeah. That, that is, that's very interesting because you're, you're correct. You know, if you're in your hotel room locked up, that's one thing, but uh, you, you know, when I was in and what I like to try to do is go and explore. Uh, you know, I was in Jamaica and I took off with his, uh, it was a doctor and a nurse and we went into this mountain village and it was really, really just really cool. Um, but that's vacation. So um, anyways, like you were saying, uh, it's cultural, but on the other hand, how do you get around? How do you, the cultures are so different in mm -hmm. every country and the language. So how do you work with that? I mean, it's half the fun for me, mm -hmm. uh, of course, yeah. which is why I, I like to I like the to arrive in a place and be completely overwhelmed and not know how to survive, which is exactly what happens in every place I go to. Like the language is dead. So I, you know, like I don't know anything. I don't know how to shop. I don't know where the laundry is. I don't know how to get around. I don't know, you know, how the public transportation system works. I don't know what I don't know. Uh, and, and I don't know how to do it all in another language. So this is why I say it takes a lot of energy to learn how to survive in a new place. So the, the tasks of daily life become a, a whole other thing when you're traveling full time. But for me, that's also half the fun. So, uh, the language is, is the, the first barrier to overcome. Uh, and I do that by at least starting off with a few phrases. So before I go to a place, if I haven't had a chance to, to take some kind of course or whatnot, at the very least, I'm going to look up the pleasantries on Google Translate and I'm going to write them down. I'm going to memorize them. I'm going to sound them out. I'm going to save them. I'm going to make sure I know how to say hello, goodbye, please, thank you, you know, various little things. How are you? <laughs> things like that. Uh, and I add to that repertoire as I'm at the place. So I continue to, you know, I might do Duolingo or some kind of language learning program or app. Um, audio lessons might take, if I'm staying somewhere for a while, I, I might actually take private lessons. Uh, and I also ask locals, you know, like if I'm speaking with a local who, who speaks English, I might say, Hey, how do I say this sentence? And they'll tell me, and I'll write it down phonetically if I need to. Yep. And I'll remember it. I remember doing this the first time I went to Thailand. Uh, and I was, on the plane ride over to Thailand and on the, the seat back, the entertainment system, they had this thing where you could learn numbers. And I'm like, oh, that's going to be useful. So by the time I got up the plane, I could count to a million in Thai. Like, that's a good start. <laughs> and I'm not an overachiever, am I? Um, and then I, as I was there, I learned some other pleasantries. And then, I, you know, someone told me, they said, oh, when you go to a Thai market, negotiate this is part of the cultural experience and the fabric it is expected that you will negotiate and here's this phrase that you say to the vendor that basically says will you negotiate it's a very local phrase and when you say that to them they'll be they'll be impressed and they'll be like game on let's do this and that's exactly what I did. So eventually I got to the point where I could walk into a Thai market. I could exchange pleasantries, initial pleasantries in Thai. I could look at an item. I could ask them to negotiate. We could do the entire negotiation process all in Thai. And then I could thank them and leave the market. This was super cool. 
And wow. that, you know, it allowed me to make connections with people uh, that I might not otherwise have been able to make. So there's one woman who was so impressed with this that she invited me back to her store and she gave me lunch one day and I had this kind of little thing going with her for a while. So those moments may be fleeting, but if you make a genuine effort to get to understand a culture and a place, and it takes effort, but that effort can be rewarded in lots of unique ways. Wow. That's yeah. It's completely different way of thinking. And uh, you know, I, I just love what you're doing. How do you find the communities though? Like if you're where you at, wherever you are right now, do you plan it three months, six months, how long in advance? And how do you know where you're going next? So those questions are, are related to, and also a little bit separate from the community question. Uh, but they are definitely all uh, part of the same answer that I'll give, which mm -hmm. is, I have, I'll start off with a story. <laughs> I wish it were a fable, but it's not. Uh, and it was after 12 years of full-time travel, I completely and utterly burnt out of the lifestyle. Uh, and I made it a little bit longer than some of my contemporaries at the time, who uh, many people came off. It, it seemed to be, I was looking at this, and it seemed to be that the shelf life was about 10 years. Most people came off the road at about the 10-year mark. And the, the reasons for each person coming off the road, I'm sure, were, were different. But for me, I can say what happened was I lost all sense of belonging in the world. Now, we have to go back to the actual time that this was. This was pre-pandemic. Remote work was not a thing necessarily. It's just starting to be a thing. You know, digital nomads. You know, I mean, when I started in this lifestyle, there were not words or terms for people who did what I did, which meant that what I was doing was I was living very locally around the world, which was exactly what I wanted to do. You were getting no complaints from me for this. But what it also meant was I was perpetually misunderstood. Right? If the number one misconception about this lifestyle is that travel equals vacation, then everyone thought I was on vacation. Everyone thought that when I was on my laptop, I was playing versus paying the bills. Mm. And uh, it was, and nobody got, nobody understood the way that I lived and wanted to travel and experience the world. So what it meant was I was perpetually the odd man out. I was perpetually swimming up a stream of misconceptions. And I, I was okay with that because I always thought, oh, well, I'm in the foreigner in my destination. I'm living locally and this, is, this comes with the territory. But what I realized in retrospect was that I, there, were, there was a way out of this. And, and this is now how I'm looking at traveling now to try new ways. So now there are ways to find community. And I went back to Canada. I burnt out. I went back to Canada. I got a place in Toronto, which is my hometown, because I thought, well, I'm looking for my people. So Canada must be my people. And I got back to Toronto and I got a place and then I realized Canada's not my people. I mean, they're not not my people, but they're not the people that I was looking for. The people I was looking for were people who share the same lifestyle that I do of working remotely and enjoying to travel the world. And so then I realized, OK, so while I was busy, um, you know, house sitting on a side of a mountain in Switzerland, I was not doing some of the things that I might have done that might have given me that sense of belonging that I was didn't realize I would, I needed. So conferences, like at the beginning of the top of the hour, we were talking about, uh, you know, digital nomad conferences. There are lots of gatherings and conferences and retreats that you can attend as a digital nomad that will allow you to connect with other people who share this lifestyle. And you can collaborate. There's from a business or personal or anything in between to be able to develop, make these social inroads with people who share some of the same ideals and ways of living their lives is very important. Uh, Co-living, which is something I'm doing this year, is another way of, of being able to make those social inroads and enjoy that sense of community with like-minded people. Co-working is another way to do it. Co-working is now something that is certainly very common around the world. There are co-working spaces that you can go to and you can enjoy uh, some time um, you know, doing your work, but then also enjoying things like work workshops and networking and all that sort of stuff. And then there's co-living and co-working programs. Now these are done for you programs that will take a lot of the work of travel out of your hands. So you don't have to work, you know, if you're doing everything on your own, you, you have to find a destination, you have to find a place to stay in that destination, research it, look for the neighborhoods, find the accommodation, book the accommodation, book the flights, figure out how to get there, figure out how, how to survive once you get there, and on and on and on. And that's a lot of time and energy. So these co-living and co-working programs 
basically you pay one fee and you show up and then you've got, you know, uh, a place to live, a co-working membership, uh, a full-time community coordinator who will hook you up with other activities in the area and a bunch of like-minded people to live and work and play with while you're there. Some of these programs offer one month deals where basically you pay for that one month, you show up to that place and they take care of everything for you when you're there. Other programs offer multi-month programs uh, where you pay one fee, you show up to the first destination and they take care of everything, including your transportation in between places. So later this year, I'm really excited. I'm gonna have my first remote year experience. I'm gonna spend four months in Africa, uh, four countries, four months. And I'm going to be doing it with another group of, with a group of remote workers. And it's all coordinated by a company called Remote Year. And this will be my first time experiencing something like this. But I know people who have done it and they just said it was amazing and in many ways life changing. So I'm looking forward to experiencing this different way of traveling the world. And stay tuned. I write about all of these sorts of things. I put it all on my YouTube channel, on all my social channels, uh, because I like to be able to show people the different ways that they can experience the world while working remotely. So there's um, a lot of Amazon sellers that are going to uh, be hearing this. And uh, just so you know, uh, one of the favorite people that come on here, Kevin King, very well known in the Amazon space. He traveled for years, not, not digital nomad, but he, what he did is he made this part of his life. And just picking up all these life experiences, doing exactly like you were talking about, going in. He wanted to go and meet people. He wanted to like just, just meet the average person and go in and, and experience the overall culture. But he did this for years and years. And he also has a ton of National Geographic quality photos and video that, you know, he sends it over to me once in a while. And it's, it's unbelievable what he did. Now, I mean, it's, it really is the best of both worlds, what what you're talking about, like being able to see that beautiful background and live it and then know that you can move on and that there's communities out there that will help support you. And uh, even your blog, for example. Uh, one of the other things, I, I know you you sent over a talking point about um, uh, hacks. Can we talk a, a little bit about hacks and then we'll get into some questions? Sure, absolutely. A uh, couple of good hacks that I have, one of which, of course, most of which, let's get it right, everything I learned, I learned the hard way. Um, but one of them is to really pay attention to ergonomics. So uh, I, <laughs> laptops are really badly named because never ever should you put your laptop on your lap <laughs> to work because you're gonna be hunched over and you're gonna be, I mean, I spent too many years you know, sitting on my bed with my laptop on my lap or having, you know, having the wrong height desk or chair or this or that. So now what I do is I have a few things that I travel with. I have a laptop stand that puts my laptop so that the screen can be at eye level. I use a Bluetooth keyboard and mouse pad and they, you know, they fold up so they're fairly small and easy to travel with. And that will help keep my arms at a 90 degree angle. And that means no matter where I go in the world and no matter what the setup is in terms of the height of the chairs or tables or desks that I'm working at, I will be able to set it up in such a way that I'm going to be able to work and be productive and not be sore or get any kind of repetitive strain injuries. Uh, with that also comes the idea that it's important to set up some kind of designated workspace. Uh, and I think we all learned this in the pandemic in one way or another. If you were locked down and working from home, I, I think most of us realized that it's important to find some way to shut the door, literally or figuratively, on your office so you can create a little bit of separation between uh, your personal life and your work life. Uh, and so those are some hacks that I can find in that sort of way. Um, accommodation hacks, obviously, if you are looking for your own accommodation, check out the, the link that has been provided with all the resources to find different kinds of accommodation. Uh, and uh, try to, uh, you know, look for little communities. So I'll give you an example. I'm going back to Madeira later this year. Uh, Madeira is a, a little, it's part of Portugal, but it's an island that is ostensibly off the coast of Africa. And I was there earlier this year and absolutely adored it. And while I was there, I discovered there was a community called Digital Nomads Madeira. And this is a community of people that were, that are uh, integrating 
digital nomads and locals and helping create uh, collaborations and opportunities for digital nomads to meet one another, but also for locals to meet digital nomads and for there to be things like skill shares and, and social opportunities. And they also have, uh, you know, Slack and WhatsApp groups and all kinds of ways to find accommodation. Now, this exists in other places in the world as well. There's lots of Facebook groups for destinations. Find the Facebook group. So if you're going to, to for, for the, the fellow who's going to Bali, look up, go to Facebook and look up Bali Digital Nomads. You're going to find a bunch of Facebook groups that will have tens of thousands of people in it. And you can join that group and you can ask questions and you can learn the things that you need to learn so that you can find cost-effective accommodation, good places to eat, co-working spaces, and social opportunities. With your travel, so this and just because I get a, a ton of points with this, that's all like I stick to a carrier. And if they're not going somewhere, I'll go to a different carrier. But um, I'm not sure if you're you're doing this, but for cutting costs and traveling a little bit more uh, comfortable, if you have those miles, like for me, I go to Delta and I'll book economy and I'll get first class just because of the miles. And I'm sure that's probably something that you do as well, because you've got those miles on your cart or on your, um, on wherever you're traveling. Is that something that you're able to do? Almost all of my long haul flights are in business class for less than the price of an economy ticket. So yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and it, it's fantastic. Now, uh, because for me, I could be traveling anywhere and everywhere in the world. I focus less on one carrier because that's a little too restrictive. Mm -hmm. But what I do try to do is I focus on at least one carrier from each alliance. Right. Uh, so then that way, if I'm uh, flying like Delta is part of the Sky team. So even if I'm flying KLM, uh, if Delta is my carrier of choice, then I'll make sure that I will attribute the points from that KLM flight over to Delta. So I focus my accumulation opportunities on certain ones. There's also some credit cards that have uh, universal or transferable points, and that's very helpful as well. Uh, and the same thing applies to hotels, because, you know, I, as much as my longer term stays are not in hotels, I stay in my fair share of hotels. And status can get you all kinds of great things that uh, will not only elevate your experience, but also will save you money. Like, for example, once you reach a certain level of status with Marriott, breakfast is always included, even if it wouldn't normally be included um, right. with a regular room at the hotel. And one thing I should mention to people, too, is that uh, I've signed up for a card called the Founders Card. And one of the benefits to this Founders Card is that uh, you pay your your regular rate and they'll automatically upgrade you um, like for Marriott, for example, they'll put you to, to gold. But if you stay so many nights, uh, they automatically bump you up to platinum, which is just a minor amount <laughs> for air travel. I did this for Australia last year. I was looking all over and I went on Qantas and they got me down. Um, so this was business class. 25% off. And it was crazy. So anywhere I go, uh, and again, here's another one. All right. So I always like uh, talking about some of the things that we do with Kevin. So Kevin and I and our wives went on this cruise last year. I used the founder's card to book the Pacific Rim Hotel in Vancouver. Kevin didn't. So <laughs> I had an upgrade, a much better view, much higher up. And it was like, it was, I paid 2,100. He ended up in a lower room paying 3,300 bucks. That's the founder's card. So mm -hmm. anyways, there it's good for a ton of stuff. Um, if anybody's interested in it, just DM me and I don't have any affiliate with them or anything, but it's something that I would highly suggest if you don't have and you do, do travel quite a bit and you just want upgrade, upgrade, upgrade for everything on top of business products as well, um, you know, check them out. I don't know if you know the founder's card. No, I haven't heard of it. Is it available to Canadians? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Ah. So oh, no, all over the world. It. Yeah. And um, you, uh, after uh, afterwards, I'll send you over the information. But cool. uh, even even so, if you upgrade, OK, now, if this isn't worth it to you, don't upgrade. But for a few hundred dollars extra, they have the concierge service. Mm -hmm. And when I was on the on, on our tour, I was calling them 
and saying, hey, where are the best places for lunch or dinner while we were in port? And they sent me three or four different places and it's all free. Like anything I want. Hey, get me a pair of shoes. Uh, order me an Uber, whatever it is. Well, they wouldn't do that. But whatever it was, they will do for you. And it's it's all concierge. So it's 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 one of these travel things that a lot of people don't realize are it's available out there. You know, I think concierge concierge service in general is a highly underestimated benefit that comes with a lot of premium credit cards. Uh, and it, it's I, I've had premium credit cards that have concierge service. And to be perfectly honest, I've never used it. But your description there, of, I mean, it, it can be so useful. I oh, don't yeah. know why I don't use it, because, yes, they will do anything and everything. They'll get you reservations at that table in the window that you wouldn't normally be able to get at the restaurant to go to and yep. they'll help you out of a bind if you've got you know a delayed flight you missed a connection or something along those lines so they'll definitely that's all right you know what thank you norm you've inspired me to look at the credit cards that i have and the concierge service i have and to start using that as well there you as go. there to you get go the founders card <laughs> i appreciate uh, it no problem all right so we do have a bunch of questions today I think we've answered a lot of them, but Kels, you want to let us know the questions? All right. From Tony, uh, he's asking, do you have any tips for Bali? He leaves tomorrow. Yes, absolutely. Uh, first of all, have a good time. Uh, I'm sure you will. Uh, there's lots of different, there's a couple of different places in Bali that are very um, digital nomad friendly. I don't know specifically where you're going, uh, but uh, my first recommendation probably is to get off that beaten path, get out of Chengdu, get out of Ubud. Uh, both of them are lovely areas, but uh, they are not representative of uh, Bali as an island. And Bali as an island is not representative of Indonesia as a country. So uh, it's definitely important to understand those distinctions. Um, also, to the ATMs in Bali, at least when I was there, and granted, this is going back to 2017, but at the time, I did a little bit of research, and I found two things, one of which is the, the ATMs there are notoriously rigged with skimmers. Oh. No, matter where, no matter where you are in the world, it's important before you stick your card into an ATM to really scrutinize that slot and make sure that there are no skimmers there, especially important in Bali. Uh, also, too, if you're going to use an ATM, make sure you're doing it uh, at an ATM that's either located inside or beside a bank and only do it during banking hours. And that way, if there's any problem associated with your transaction, you can fix like if it eats your card, you can fix it right away. Um, also, uh, be careful of money exchange scams. That's uh, uh, <laughs> I have an article about uh, a morning that I spent in Kuta in Bali where I had to exchange some money and I experienced every scam in the book. And the only way I knew that I was getting scammed in each of those incidences is because I read up on it and, and learned about <laughs> what was happening. Uh, and so I, mean, I was able to catch them in the moment and say, no, 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 give me my money back. Uh, so those would be probably the top tips I have. Okay, very good. Next question, sir. Okay, this one is from Rich. Uh, any advice on towing young kids along with you on these adventures, specifically elementary age? So I don't have children. I haven't traveled with children, but I have many colleagues and friends who have. Uh, so I'm not necessarily the uh, kind of experienced source of advice that you might want, but I can certainly point you in the direction of some traveling families um, one off the top of my head is a family called Growing Up Without Borders, uh, and that's a family of five. They have three girls that they've been traveling with now for oh, probably almost 10 years. Um, I listened to a podcast the other day that I found very interesting, and they were talking about traveling with children and uh, how important it was for them to allow the children to just kind of creatively experience the destination. So instead of bringing your children on a series of activities and things that you organize, that you are trying to, you know, that you feel will enrich, of course, their lives and yours, um, just allowing your children to show up and, uh, you know, do what they're going to do, you know, Hey, let's go here. And so, okay, great. So let's go to this thing, you know, this place. So the, the podcast that I was listening to, the guy was saying that they were, in, he was in Paris. And first of all, children will attract local attention. 
Uh, and so, and the, the further you are from your home country or culture, the more attention your children might get. And that's really cool because that means you're going to connect with people through your children. So allow that to happen. But uh, in this particular instance, he's in Paris with his uh, son and just, you know, the son is saying, oh, let's go here, let's go there. So he's indulging his son's curiosities and going wherever they want to go. And he said, we would never have ended up where we ended up on that day and in that moment. And he said, and that would have been tragic. He said, because we wound our way through to the steps of the Sacre Coeur, which is at sunset which is arguably one of the best places to be in Paris at sunset. <laughs> it's absolutely gorgeous. And there's so much going on. And they just spent an hour there together. Children with the, his kid was playing uh, and playing with other people and then playing with locals. And they just had this really amazing organic experience. So um, I think probably try not to over plan and allow your children to direct the way. And I think that you will find that you can make some really interesting connections. Okay. All right. Our next question we touched on this a little bit but uh from spencer what do you do about the language barrier i always make sure that i learn a few pleasantries before i even arrive at the destination and then i always make sure that my phone is equipped with a uh, data connection and that allows me to continue to use google translate in a variety of different ways uh you can use there's a voice function that google translate has where you can speak whatever it is that you need to say, and it's going to spit it out in their language. And then you can either show your phone to them and then they can read what it is that you said, or you can hit a button and it will sound it out so they can hear what it is that you said. And the same thing goes the other way. Then they can speak into your phone and then you can read or hear what it is that they're telling you. So you can have a, albeit contrived, but a real-time conversation with someone. You can also take pictures of a menu, for example, uh, and if you have that local data connection, it will translate it for you. Uh, but also uh, important if you're going to use the Google Translate, sometimes the data, you know, your data connection won't always be solid or there. So download the dictionary when, when you're on a Wi-Fi connection in advance. And then that way, even if you don't have a connection, you can uh, translate, use the regular normal translate feature to translate uh, words and phrases as you go. That uh, that feature for the images has saved me so many times when I go to right. order food. <laughs> right, exactly. Also, um, I, I traveled to Korea for a little bit, and um, I know some languages too. They have their own um, dictionary apps or like their own Google Translates, which function better in their language than Google Translate does. So, like for South Korea, there was a specific app called Papago. And that app worked way better and was way more accurate than something like Google Translate too. So I think it's specific on like the different characters they're using and it's not for every country, but mm. that's a little tip too from my travels. Um, that's a great piece of advice. That also applies to maps as well. Certain map oh, applications yes. are more used in certain places than others. So like uh, in many Asian countries, maps.me is more common than for example, Google Maps. Yeah, and I think South Korea it's neighbor, so. If anyone's heading to South Korea, check that out. <laughs> um, okay, uh, a comment from Tony. Uh, I have used Show Around app to meet people in other in over twenty countries. Have you ever used that app, Nora? Nope. No, I haven't. I've never even no. heard of it. Okay, yeah. Thanks for the tip, Tony. Um, and from Rad, uh, do you carry any power sources to keep your equipment charged uh, over the night? Do you use any headlamps or rechargeable batteries? You know, I used to travel uh, all the time with a rechargeable headlamp. I have to say I've gotten a little bit lazy about it in, in recent uh, months and trips and whatnot that I do uh, because I've been experimenting more with like super duper ultralight travel. So I'll go on like a six month trip with carry on luggage only. So a headlamp isn't always uh, uh, you know, that sometimes that gets on the goes on the chopping block. Um and if I do have a portable charger, which I do generally have some kind of uh, backup charger, it's a really small one. Mm -hmm. So it'll be enough to save my phone if I'm, you know, not able to properly charge my phone uh, or if I need to wait till I get back to my accommodation. So it's not a proper huge power bank. It's just a little charger, but it's enough to uh, get through uh, any particular moments where I might not uh, have full battery capabilities. All right. Okay. So uh, let's see. Last chance to get in on hashtag or on Wheel of Kelsey today. That's hashtag Wheel of Kelsey. Tag two people, and you'll uh, get a second entry. 
And before we go and do that, where can people get a hold of you? Where can they contact you? Uh, if you want, it's only if you want. <laughs> um, my online home is theprofessionalhobo.com. And that is where you will find basically links to all the other places where I am. So I am on YouTube as well. If you search for Nora Dunn, you will find my channel, which has recently started taking off. It's kind of exciting. I've had over a million views in the last month. So Whoa. Uh, yeah, I have a series called Travel Smart in Style, where I provide videos that will uh, help people through various parts of the travel process, regardless of whether or not you're an actual digital nomad, you'll get some tips there. And I also like to review uh, travel gear and remote work tools. Uh, in a separate series on that channel. Uh, and then, of course, there's all the links to uh, from the professionalhobo.com. You will also find all my social handles, which most cases are just the professional hobo. All right. Very good. All right, Kels, let's go to the last uh, sponsor and then we'll head over to the Wheel of Kelsey. All right. Just give me a second. Anytime, have... Kels. Yeah. I, I know you're a little rusty after Easter. I want to give a quick shout out to an incredible group of sponsors who help keep our podcast running. The Lunch with Norm podcast wouldn't be possible without the support of the following sponsors. Wally Smarter, Post Purchase Pro, VAA Philippines, Jeff Schick Law, Rebade, Honu Worldwide, Extreme Power, Dragonfish Brand Management, and Startup Club. Thank you. And now back to our show. Wow, somebody did work on the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Hayden. Yeah, wow. all right. Okay, so let's go over and let's see who the winner is. All right, here is the Wheel of Kelsey. It's time for the Wheel of Kelsey. Did you get rad? He just put, yes. oh yeah, you did. Yeah, okay, did. very good. All right. So thank you everyone who entered today's Wheel of Kelsey. Um, I'm going to give this a shuffle. We do this every single podcast. So make sure you come back Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 12 Eastern time. And let's see. Oh, who, let's oh land. I was going to say he landed on Tony. But uh, all right, Rich. All right. Congratulations, Rich. If you can just send me over uh, your address and um, contact me, Kay, at lunchwithnorm.com, and we'll hook you up with your book. Fantastic. All right, Nora. Thank you so much for coming on today. It was, it was great. Um, you know, we started talking about this a few months ago on the, uh, the ship and, uh, I was really looking forward to you coming on and helping explain the digital nomad nomad lifestyle. So thanks. Thanks again. Well, thank you, Norman. I can't wait to see where in the world we are going to meet up next because you do a lot of travel yourself. Tons. And I, I'm hoping that we're going to meet up in some amazing and random location not too long from now. Two Canadians having a Tim Hortons. <laughs> Why not? All right. Okay, everybody. So thank you so much. Want more great information? Don't forget to subscribe by clicking here. Also, if you want to check out our latest podcasts, Click over here. Lunch with the